Hello everyone, I am Animesh Ghar. I am a faculty at University of Toronto and I also spend time at Vector Institute in NVIDIA. And I work on building robots that can work uh, in a generalized manner in challenging and unstructured and unseen, unseen uh, situations. And really the goal as a roboticist here is to build some sort of out of the box autonomy which can do a variety of skills uh, that has been promised to us uh, by uh, fiction and science fiction over the years, such as this video. So today I'm going to talk to you about a piece of this problem of how to build structured inductive biases for imitation learning uh, from videos. Just looking at this video that I showed you earlier, uh, to build a robot that can work in a home, we might want it to do a variety of tasks from vacuuming, sweeping, cooking, laundry, uh, and whatnot. Not only do we want the robot to work in this clean environment with uh, train, training settings, we want it to actually generalize to new diversity of scenes, tools, new objects, and perhaps even more complexity of scenes where uh, longer term planning is required that was not observed during training. Now, really, the goal is to build these robotic companions that can enable us to enrich and augment our physical and cognitive capabilities. But the question is really how? If we look at how humans uh, do this, people are really good at learning quickly and generalizing. It is uh, argued by neuroscientists that people use the idea of imitation learning extensively. Babies at the age of 18 months can do direct imitation of uh, simple activities and by the time they are two years old they can actually achieve assembly by watching TV. In fact, if we observe, half of YouTube is actually how-to videos. This really tells us uh, the nature of content we share with each other is often instructional. So if we go back, I argue to build such intelligent robotic companions, we need a two-stage two pipeline. The first stage is to the ability to understand demonstrations, where the demonstrations may arrive in variety of modalities, maybe teleoperation, video, or language and then learn policies from these demonstrations, and then generalize from these demonstrations to new uh, but similar uh, conceptual settings. And to do so, we need algorithms uh, which can learn with structured inductive biases and priors over data. So let's talk about some compositional tasks. Maybe you want to do laundry. Uh, it requires you to grab uh, the laundry basket and pick and place every object until all of the uh, articles or items of clothing are in the washer, then maybe add soap and, and that comprises of the task of laundry. Or perhaps you might want to do object stacking or clean up of the house as this uh, cute little Wally is doing. But all of these tasks, if you really think about, are compositional in nature. If we think about how such compositional tasks are performed right now, one approach may be to design finite state machines. It is intuitive to design and easy to diagnose. This is an example of my own work uh, using automation from finite state machines. In this case, we were doing surgery uh, with finite state machines or surgical subtasks. However, the interesting thing is that these finite state machines fail in rather non-intuitive uh, manners uh, because uh, the behavior tree uh, does not capture the states uh, in which your system might go uh, and being being able to sort of build uh, failure or recovery mechanisms for all such cases can actually be very tedious if non to if uh, if doable at all for all the variety of cases uh, that may exist another solution can be uh, reinforcement learning, but reinforcement learning by itself for long-term tasks can, rather, uh, can be rather sample inefficient. Similarly, if we do direct imitation learning, uh, even though it may feel that uh, it is obvious, but it is actually rather non-trivial. 
how do we go about doing the task segmentation so that we can actually do the imitation? How do we handle multimodality of the solutions? Uh, and how do we even come up with primitives and what sort of uh, permutation of primitives do we need to imitate? So we argue that the solution to such problems of generalization lie with meta-imitation learning. Let me explain what I mean by this. Let's take a very simple domain. Let's assume that the task domain is this simple uh, block wall, and every task is a permutation of blocks. So some instructional demos can be given to you such that each of them achieve a certain permutation. And during training, the, the task is to learn to perform these tasks through demonstration. And at test time, what we will do is we will specify a particular task with a single demonstration. Uh, it can be video or a particular, just the goal specification of the uh, final state. And we want the agent to come up with a policy that can perform this task in closed loop. Now, this idea of one-shot imitation learning, particularly from videos or instructional videos, has been quite popular of late. But if we look at the methods that have attempted such a task, often they model the input demonstration as uh, a simple sequence of images, as a flat sequence, and they do not really leverage uh, the structure either in the images or in the task itself. We would want to use this compositional hierarchy both in the representation and in the supervision uh, to be able to get better performance and generalization. So today, in this context of imitation learning from instructional videos, I will talk about four pieces of work uh, that build on each other incrementally uh, to enable us to do one-shot imitation uh, through different uh, lenses. So let's look at neural task programming line of work first. So let's think about how would we go about building an algorithm that would perform uh, a single step of block stacking. If this was to be done uh, explicitly, this would mean that you would write a program which would put the red block on the top of blue block. And a program might look uh, something like this. If we wanted to do something slightly different, we have to write a new program. And this space of programs is actually combinatorial, where the low-level primitives stay the same, the function calls. However, their ordering and permutation uh, can change. Relying on this uh, intuition, we pose this meta-learning problem as a learning to predict the next program. So we are really thinking about this hierarchical policy learning problem as a program induction setup, where you are provided some demonstration as input. You also uh, want to condition the policy or the predictor model uh, on current state and what is the current program being called. And then the output is to predict what next program to, uh, to, to call or to run and what arguments to call it with. This model can be trained uh, through comparison or direct comparison with ground truth programs. And these ground truth programs can be achieved by running a motion planner in these domains. So to train something like this, uh, we essentially have a sequence of demos. And each of these demonstrations can be paired with a hierarchical program trace, which is essentially uh, supervision on what uh, programs uh, we want them to uh, we want the system to learn to run so the key tr structure here is that these programs at the low level are modular and our our model is really learning to compose these programs on the fly so what does this look like in a very simple pick and place kind of setup we can assume that at any point of time the model is outputting either the output program or uh, the probability that the current program will end and if the output program is at the level of API call of the robot uh, or not. And if it is the API call, then you actually execute it on the robot without going, without further uh, bifurcation or hierarchy, without going down the hierarchy of uh, program calls. What does this look like? This may look like where you start with a video and the policy outputs this complicated uh, program structure. But 
If we really look into this, what is happening is the policy outputs a high level program, let's say block stacking. Each block stacking program will call a subroutine pick and place, which in turn will call a subroutine pick. Now pick is composed of two subroutines. One is a move block where uh, the program predicts the move to, which is an API level command and the block E, which is the function that you call this program with. When move to is complete, pick goes, uh, the program counter goes back to pick, pick moves on to the grasping part. And when this is complete, pick is complete and the program goes back up to pick in place, goes back uh, and moves to the place part of the task, where now it goes to a different position to place this object. Once the position is reached, it can release the object. And once this part is complete, the program counter goes back up to block stacking and continues uh, to do further block stacking. Notice that this is just one pick and place operation. We evaluate our model on much longer, more complicated tasks. So what does this really enable? This enables us to provide instructional demonstrations, perhaps through a VR setup, where the agent will get to observe this video and then it has to come up with a policy that will achieve this task. In this particular case, notice it's the configuration or the permutation of blocks, not their position exactly. Uh, and uh, the system can come up with a policy to achieve this task. It is important to note that it is actually a policy, not just a parser, which would mean that if there is stochastic dynamics or an adversarial agent or something happens where part of the uh, solution uh, goes back, uh, then the system does not actually continue performing the demonstration, but goes back to fix the state through a generation of actions that will uh, be unseen in the demonstration. So it really is a closed loop feedback policy. So looking at these uh, quantitative results, what we find in this case is that our model uh, can perform fairly well in training data where the tasks are seen uh, with state input. Uh, but interestingly, uh, you can actually also do this on vision input. So now not only uh, the input of the demonstration is actually a sequence of images. In this case, you can compare a detector-based model, which is a two-stage pipeline where you uh, detect the positions of each of these blocks and then the detection output is fed to uh, fed as a state to the model and we can also do an end-to-end -end pipeline we notice the end-to-end -end pipeline doubles the performance uh, and the reason in this particular case being the fact that no detector is perfect and because the detector cannot actually uh, have error estimates that are conveyed to the uh, downstream planner uh, the failures uh, accumulate. On the contrary, in an end-to-end -end model, uh, the planner uh, can accommodate uh, errors in the detector. Essentially, what we realize is this case that we can get much better generalization than a flat policy, and we can make uh, these imitation learning algorithms work with vision. However, we know that it doesn't work all the time. Uh, interestingly, in this case, uh, it can fail when the low level primitives are not uh, tuned correctly or do not return the right uh, mode of success. So let's look at how we can extend this idea of neural task programs to uh, domains where uh, this was not working. So if we go back and check what the model looked like in the case of neural task program, we had an end-to-end -end model uh, which was predicting programs. What we can really think about is we provided a particular kind of modular inductive bias on the input output by making it program structure. However, the model itself is still an LSTM, which is basically a black box model. So now the question we are asking is, perhaps we can open this black box figuratively and provide some sort of compositional model prior. This compositional model prior can actually look like a graph. This graph is technically over the sequence of actions that you can take to go from one state to another state, which is basically a start state to a goal state. So this model now uh, is, is modeling this problem instead of a program induction problem, but as a graph induction problem. So you are doing hierarchical policy learning as a graph induction problem. This particular part consists of two stages. The first stage is 
you parse the demonstration into a task graph. The task graph completes uh, uh, a sequence of observed actions and imputes other potential actions that may be useful to come to achieve the goal. And then there's a task graph executor, which is really the policy given this task graph, what policy should be executed in a closed loop setup. The important thing here is the object of task graph. In a more na naive setting or intuitive setting, we can have states as nodes and actions as uh, edges. However, uh, in these kind of settings, the states can be combinatorial. So the key structure here is to use this idea of conjugate task graph. Here, we flip the model of nodes and edges, and now actions become nodes, and edges are really states. Uh, we can think about them as preconditions and postconditions to actions. Using this idea of conjugate task graph uh, enables us to have uh, a finite representation of uh, the system or the states because the number of actions is finite. So now uh, the task graph executor can look at an observation uh, a node localizer is essentially looking at what action was performed. Given the action performed, we can decide what state uh, the system is in. And given the current state, we can decide what the next action should be. So this starts to look like a framework of closed loop policy. So going back, now we have this model which can be trained directly with demonstrations. And another interesting thing to note is we do not need hierarchical supervision in this case. So going back to the same task of uh, block stacking, uh, if you remember, these are results from neural task programming where for with full state information, the neural task programming was achieving 84% of success. And with visual input, we were achieving 62% of success. Now, interestingly, we see that neural task graphs uh, narrowly beats the performance with full information, but even more so, so uh, uh, with end-to-end -end visual input, we can actually get a substantial performance boost. So really the takeaway here is that with weaker supervision, without having the hierarchical program trace, we can get better generalization with visual input following videos uh, as instructions. So continuing in this line of work, we actually were able to apply this idea not only to block stacking, but other similar compositional setups where we could do object sorting, uh, perhaps table cleanup, or even search and prediction in a navigation uh, for uh, indoor object navigation and uh, um, object localization uh, setups. In fact, we were able to apply this idea of discovering task graphs in a realistic setting where this is a data set of surgical subtasks, uh, and we applied it to two particular tasks, suturing and not tying. The world consists of 15 primitives, such as movement, pulling, pushing uh, needles. And we applied it as a test case to a different task of passing needles. These are tasks that are used to train surgeons. And we evaluate the task graph generator in its prediction of what uh, prediction of the path. And we notice that uh, our model can predict not only uh, a single path as a parser, but actually closed loop sequences such that uh, the system can uh, recover from errors, which is very interesting. So moving forward, what I've described so far is our two abstractions where we can provide particular kinds of uh, structured biases or inductive biases in the model, one as program induction and other as graph structured uh, model, uh, which enables us to get better generalization with peak supervision. So if we go back and look at the results from neural task graphs, one of the things that actually catches attention is the amount of data required. Even though we are getting good performance, but the data required in these kind of settings is actually non-trivial. In these simulated or simple settings, uh, we still need a thousand tasks. 100 demonstrations per task, which basically means that we are operating with 100,000 demos. For simple domains, this may be possible, but for many domains, such data sets may not be available. So a question that we are asking is, can we trade off demonstration data with perhaps problem structure specification? 
can we provide some structure about the problem or the plan uh, so that we do not need to provide as much data? So going back uh, to the model structure, we really see that this idea of end-to-end -end learning is, is really neat, but it does not give us low data efficiency. On the contrary, what we could do is provide some domain knowledge about the, about the problem to achieve this, uh, achieve this sort of data efficiency. One way to provide domain knowledge is to provide uh, a symbolic plan uh, or a domain definition language, which basically tells you what actions are valid, what actions required, what prerequisites, and, and uh, what, what actions result in post conditions. Uh, so this idea of symbolic planning has been very popular in uh, discrete uh, planning and uh, task and motion planning. And uh, it is really uh, very intuitive in the sense, in this simple example of putting one block in, on another block, we can think of demonstration as specifying a particular goal. Uh, any initial state is a sequence of predicates and the symbolic planner can output a sequence of actions that will take this initial state to the goal state. So this model that we have built composes of two steps. One is this idea of symbol grounding, where you can look at two different states, both from the uh, goal specification or the demonstration and the observation, uh, and uh, put them into uh, representations that enable you to plan with. And then the other is the continuous planning model, which allow, which is required to take the output of the essentially state estimation model uh, to plan with. So let's look at what this would mean. So a current observation in this simple example can be uh, uh, two blocks on the table, which basically means clear A and clear B. And when you put one block on another block, the predicates may update to on A and B. So A is on B and uh, A is clear. So there's nothing on A. Now, what we pose this problem as is a learning uh, problem where we look at images of these uh, states and predict these predicates. Now, the symbol grounding as it is has been done previously. So you can essentially learn a classifier, uh, a multi-class classifier. In this case, we share weights so that we can have uh, efficiency across predicates. But an interesting thing to note here is that if we convert uh, these predicates to discrete states, such as clear A or on A or B, then we are assuming that our classifier is correct. But that is not necessarily always the case. Uh, sometimes classifier may result in incorrect outputs or may actually be confused about the state. Uh, in that case, uh, the symbolic state that we will recover will actually be invalid. In this particular case, we clearly know that B is not clear, yet the model can in principle output something like that. If that happens, uh, pushing in a state like that to a symbolic planner would result in an automatic planning failure. Uh, this would not be able to uh, parse uh, an input like this and, uh, and we cannot proceed. A solution to this may involve defining explicitly certain predicates that may not be true together, such as clear B and clear A uh, cannot be true both if A is on B. But defining such predicates requires a lot of manual input and may not be scalable if the number of predicates are large. So what we do is, instead of converting the output of a symbol grounding network to an explicit discrete representation, we restrict ourselves to the softmax outputs, which is basically a continuous representation of this output. But such a representation cannot be fed into a symbolic planner, hence we have to adapt the planner itself. Let me describe how that works. So we, have, we will take the input continuous input and keep it as a continuous space input described uh, over predicates. But then this will be fed into a continuous planning problem planner, which will operate very similarly to a symbolic planner. So let's look at what symbolic planning means. And then we will describe how this is each of these phases is converted to a continuous plan. A continuous, uh, a symbolic planner has a state representation. The state representation looks at a list of applicable actions at any point of time. After the application of these actions, the state is updated. And then at the, at the end of this state, you 
after you execute this action, you compare the current state with the goal state to give you a notion of what needs to be done next or if the program is done. Now, in our case, for state representation, we have a certain set of predicates, but we represent the state of predicates as a vector where uh, the output or at any point of time, the state can be represented as a, a multiplication of these probabilities of each predicate being positive or true. And for predicates that are not true, for example, uh, we can represent uh, these probabilities differently. So we get different state representations in a continuous domain without going to a discrete predicate of For applicable actions, uh, each action requires us to check the preconditions for predicates. In this case, instead of checking explicitly, we can confirm uh, if all of the predicates are true by multiplication of their uh, output probabilities. Similarly, uh, for application of actions, in discrete case, we only do it unimodally, but in this case, we can we have to be uh, aware of the fact that the prediction of symbol grounding network is not exact. It can be multimodal. Hence, uh, if the predicate is not correct, uh, then it can result in an execution failure. We need to account for this explicitly in uh, our representation. And then when we need to do comparison for state satisfaction or goal satisfaction, we can directly do comparisons of this state representation in embedding spaces. So this now gives us an, a planner which we can operate with. So let's talk about how we can apply this planner uh, to a real state setting. We can take this demonstration, we can pass it through a grounding network, uh, and now we want to achieve the same configuration as the demonstration achieves. In this case, uh, we compare it with four different heuristics. One, heurist, uh, one baseline is the NTG baseline, which we know that can do very well, but at very high data regimes. In the data regimes of just 50 training tasks, the performance is actually rather, uh, rather low. We can have a better baseline where we have a symbolic planner. We can take the output of the symbol, uh, symbolic grounder, uh, grounding network and discretize it and pass it to a symbolic planner. We notice that it only results in minor uptrend. And then we can use manual heuristics to correct uh, explicitly uh, what are valid states and invalid states in this symbolic planner, which can be very tedious, but can be really thought of as, a, a, as an oracle or an upper bound. And what we see is our model in this case uh, can achieve, the continuous planner can achieve uh, very high performance in very low data regimes that is very close to essentially the upper bound. So qualitatively, given a demonstration, uh, in this case, neural task graphs uh, fails because it cannot actually infer the goal. The symbolic planner actually just outputs invalid state, which results in planning failure. And our model can actually perform this task uh, to completion. Now, we can do this on other examples as well, such as object sorting, where the task is the permutation of objects uh, in each bin. Uh, similarly, the task is specified as a demonstration. Uh, and in this case, we can again look at the same baselines and we find uh, that uh, our continuous planner can achieve this task pretty much with the same level of performance as manual heuristics with only eight examples or eight, eight training tasks, uh, uh, while uh, baselines require much more data to achieve similar performance. So moving on, what, what we have done so far is I've talked about how we can improve uh, the data efficiency of these planning algorithms uh, in one-shot imitation tasks. But one thing that often gets left behind in this case is, in this particular case, essentially we are specifying some goal and we are estimating some state. But this was assuming that I can infer the goal state unambiguously. So in this particular case, let's say I am performing this, this sequence of tasks where maybe I wanted to cook some tomato soup. So I pour the tomato soup, put the bowl on the stove and put it back. We need to infer this goal and now come with a policy such that robot will be able to execute. 
But let's look at an example. In this case, let's assume that I have a, uh, I have a space that is marketed into workspace and storage. And I see this example where the video plays and the task looks something like this. So it could be inferred that the task is to move this cheese box from workspace to storage. But then if I actually show you the full video, it may be apparent that the task is not to move from workspace to storage, but rather you are clearing uh, the cheese from blocking the bowl so that you can put the bowl on store. So clearly, cheese it was a constraint rather than an objective. The objective was the bowl. So goal inference here can actually be ambiguous. So now we need to understand and, and define what is required while what is a constraint. So in this particular case, moving the cheese it is uh, only completing a constraint. Uh, so you are moving this to storage and moving uh, or moving the cheese it out of the way. So we define uh, the idea of a task predicate, which is something like a required part of the task or required part of the goal, while a motion predicate is something that is needed to do so that you can achieve the goal, but it is not necessarily uh, part of the goal specification. So in this particular case, we are provided with a motion uh, video demonstration uh, we run object pose detectors uh, in this example. Once we have all of the object poses, we segment the task into uh, each segment where only one object is moving. Uh, we, we apply these task predicates and motion predicates on all of these uh, individual segments. And then we have to classify when uh, the, the cheese in box was moved. Was it part of the goal or was it part of a constraint? Uh, so was it a task predicate or a motion predicate? And in this particular case, the way to do that is to think about this as looking at data, what is the likelihood that this was motion predicate or a, goal, a task predicate? One way to really think about this can be uh, a mechanism of Bayesian inference where you can think of what is the posterior estimate of the trajectory being optimal given the goal was, let's say, a motion predicate? This can be done in uh, inverse reinforcement learning or inverse planning framework where we are doing simult uh, goal inference. This idea can then be used to disambiguate goals. So let's say you have two goals, M and G. One is a motion predicate, G is a task predicate, and you see some data. Now, this data uh, may tell you that the likelihood of this particular trajectory is fairly equal. But if you see some other trajectories, uh, the difference uh, of or the likelihood of that particular trajectory under one particular goal uh, can break these ties for you. So we use this idea of inverse planning to break such ties to understand uh, or to, uh, to infer if a particular predicate was part of the goal or was a constraint. Using this model, we can now uh, look at tasks such as this mock cooking space where uh, we want to provide demonstrations in this mock kitchen space and then have a robot perform these tasks in a kitchen setup. The setup of the task is uh, we would want to cook either of these two objects. We have certain blocking objects uh, and a block setup uh, may, may be blocking this particular task where the task is to pour uh, soup into bowl, put bowl on, on stove, and put sto a bowl back out on the workspace. Uh, and we have to infer which of these predicates are task predicates or required objectives uh, or motion predicates. So in terms of results, what we notice is if we only look at the final state, we get very good recall, but very low precision. Essentially, uh, the system learns to imitate the demonstration as it is. So if it is solving a lot of these constraints, it will, uh, our system will also try to do that, which is not the right thing to do. Now we can look at task predicates where we can uh, infer all of the predicates in the demonstration explicitly, which clearly improves performance. And our model, which does the right goal inference, uh, can improve performance even further. But interestingly, if you look at only the F1 score or 
or the geometric or the harmonic mean of precision recall uh, only for the block, should I move the block or not, then we see that the difference between express, specifically predicting a predicate is much uh, more in our case than uh, with the baseline. And the success rate of the whole task actually jumps express, uh, in our case because we have explicit goal inference. So looking at these results, now we can look at uh, a specification of a task. In this case, uh, a cheesy box needs to be put in storage. Uh, you put uh, tomato soup in bowl. You put uh, the bowl to cooking and cooking back. And this would be the task. And really, the inferred goal is only three steps. And, and we basically see that our robot, in this case, is able to achieve uh, those exact three steps without specification of the fact that moving cheese it or spam uh, or interacting with them is not required. So really, uh, today I talked about uh, a number of these algorithms, uh, starting from a pure uh, video with hierarchical imitation up down to doing goal inference, which is much more uh, sample efficient. However, it trades off data uh, with human supervision. So really what we I want uh, you to take away in this particular case is that by providing particular kinds of structured inductive biases, we can perform hard compositional tasks, which would be very hard to do with models like reinforcement learning in a manner that is both very efficient and can be done from an end-to-end -end manner without specifying domain-specific uh, perception. Going forward, we would like to actually be able to expand our ability to understand videos, not to just uh, sequences of uh, tasks where we are doing activity segmentation, but to structured representations of uh, these videos so that each of these tasks can be performed in a manner where we can understand the dependencies uh, between these tasks. And not only this, we need representations within the scenes that can capture 3D information and information about the relative structure of the objects, perhaps as scene graphs, uh, to understand both changes in spatiotemporal domains and also to understand changes which can result in uh, end of activity, such as cracking eggs or defining failure uh, of in cracking this activity so that you have to do restarts and recovery. With that, I'd like to thank a number of my advisors and students who worked on these papers. Here is a list of papers that I described today. And I'd like to thank you all for being here uh, today in, in the virtual space uh, in this workshop uh, and I will be available for questions uh, later today. Thank you very much.